Okay, so it's time to get into some of the fun stuff. Let's start getting some work done. So this video, now that we're caught up, is going to be about how to use the Pullmax with a sandwich die to stretch in a bead. The Pullmax is perfect for this because it requires no pre-stretching, which you would have to do if you used a bead roller. If you're going to do this task with a bead roller, which you can do, you'd have to pre-stretch the entire bead line in order to create enough length to add that third dimension to your panel. If you don't do that, it's going to rob material from the outside edges and warp your entire panel. I'll be making lots of specific videos to pre-stretching beads on why you do it, how you do it, and when you do it on my channel, so make sure you check those out. But the beautiful thing about a Pullmax is if you do it right, you don't have to pre-stretch at all. You can trap that material and make sure that the Pullmax machine stretches the bead into place as opposed to forms the bead into place, which is what a bead roller does. So let's go ahead and get started. Now this detail I put in right here for the brake hydro boost was made on the Pullmax machine with this plywood die right here. This is made out of two pieces of plywood screwed together. I prefer cabinet grade hardwood. It's a little bit more expensive, but it holds up much, much better. So the magic to this trick is having two pieces of wood that the detailed section you're trying to create are matched exactly. So there's a couple tricks to that. A oscillating drum sander is the easiest way. You can get a real cheap one at Harbor Freight. Even like a Craftsman one, super cheap. And all these screws right here around the outside that are running through the panel, sandwiching your panel between the two pieces of wood is how the magic happens. By having a matched piece of wood underneath, a matched piece of wood on top, screws going through the metal, squishing this like a sandwich, these screws prevent the metal from pulling into the bead area as you're stretching the bead into position. You can see where we welded the screw holes shut around the outside of that bead. Like I said before, I'm going to have specific videos on this exact topic on the pre-stretching and why this sandwich die works what happens if you don't pre-stretch when you need to pre-stretch, and I'll be sure to cover the entire topic in great detail. So make sure you check out those videos on my channel. If they're not there yet, they will be coming soon. I already mapped out all the dimensions of what I'm going for here. Where the heat and AC lines come through, there is a metal plate. This center hole is what I need to cut out for the vintage air. This middle line is the metal trim plate and the outer line is where the stepped panel is going to be with the same reveal as the design over there. This sharpie line here represents the inner fender when it's bolted in place. I'm going to transfer that design onto two pieces of three quarter inch hardwood plywood and make sure that they're keyed together and everything lines up top and bottom perfectly. That's really really important. So this is a really basic shape, which makes it perfect for this demonstration video. But in all reality, you can do any size, shape, or design you want, and it all works the same way. Now, a sandwich die is just what it sounds like. You're basically making a sandwich. You are sandwiching the metal panel in between two identical dies. The upper piece of plywood and the bottom piece of plywood are going to be made exactly the same. We're going to screw them together with the piece of metal in between. That is the key to making this work, and I'll explain that more later in the video on why this works with no pre-stretch. The step that we're putting in this firewall is a pretty basic square, or almost a square. It's six and a half inches by six and a quarter inches. I prefer to have about a two to three inch perimeter left around the opening in the sandwich dot. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut a 12 by 12 square, and I'm gonna need two of those. So we have two identical 12 by 12 squares. For right now, we only need one of them for our layout. So let's set the other one aside. 
All right, so I got my 12 by 12. Let's go ahead and lay out our six and a half by six and a quarter square in the center of this. When I drew my pattern on the vehicle, I like to radius my corners with common objects around the shop. One of my favorites is a roll of tape. I like to use the inside the cardboard roll. I use that a lot. Wear a brand new roll for the outside. Sometimes we'll use the bottom of a paint can, a uh, little roll lock, discs, anything that you can find around the shop, you can get a nice consistent radius. For this one, I use the inside of the roll of tape. Let's line that up and put our corners on. So nothing too fancy, nice and simple. Now we need to measure the diameter of this. We need to get a hole saw that is equal to or just a little bit smaller than the diameter of the ID of this roll of tape. Just shy of three inches. It's like two and fifteen sixteenths. We're not going to get that picky about it. We're going to call it three inches. Now the quick and dirty way to get that material out of there is to find that right size hole saw and core out all four corners. Then you can take a little hand jigsaw or a sawzall, rough cut the center out, then you can sand the middle of that to the line and be real accurate. Now normally on smaller circles, I like to use this circle guide that you can get at like an arts and crafts store. Uh, I think I got this at like Staples. This has a bunch of different size circles. And the neat thing about this is, is it has little hash marks on every circle at all the corners of the 90 degree intersections. So what I like to do is say we're doing a two inch. I'll take this two inch one, I'll lay it down on top of my pattern, line it up, and then I'll put a little tick mark at all four intersections of the crosshatch. hatch. I'll take a straight edge, connect the dots, find the center. Now here's the problem I have right now. This only goes to two and a quarter, and we're doing a three inch hole. Let me show you another super secret trick on how to find the center of a circle of any size circle, no matter how big it is. Okay, for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna use the outside of this tape. So we're working with something a little bit bigger, so it's a little easier for you to see. It doesn't even matter the size of the circle. It just needs to be a circle. It could be a little tiny circle. It could be a circle this big. It could be a huge circle. It doesn't matter. And we don't even need to know what the diameter of this is. I'm not even gonna think about it. Take a ruler. Pick a point on the edge of the circle. Anywhere, it doesn't matter. Put the corner of the ruler on the edge. Slide the ruler until an easy number that you can divide in half lines up anywhere else on the circle. I'm going to slide this down until the four inch mark is on an edge. So now I have zero on an edge and four on an edge. We're going to put a mark. Well, we're going to draw a line there. And I'm going to put a mark in the center of that measurement. So that's four inches. I'm going to put a mark at the two inch mark. Okay, so we have from here to here is four inches. I put a mark in the middle. Pick anywhere else in the circle and do the same thing. And you don't even need to use the same numbers. I could go from zero to two. I could go to three. You just need to have an, a number you can easily divide in half and then draw a line and put a mark at the halfway point. For simplicity, let's do it at four again. And again, it doesn't matter what number you choose. Just draw a line. There's the four inch point. There's the center at two inches. Now, you need to take a triangle or some sort of right angle tool. On your line you drew, at the center point, put a 90 degree corner off of that, 90 degrees. On the other line, do the same thing. On your line to your center point, do a 90 degree corner. The point at where those lines intersect 
is the exact center of your circle, no matter how big the circle is. So we have this radius corner. We need to make this a full circle. So I'm gonna end up putting this back on here. Line that back up. Let's make all these corners full circles. All right, let's start with the first one. It's only a three inch circle, so let's do a, a two inch line. There's the one mark. Bring this down, two inch line. I'm not going to show you all these. I'll just do this first one. 90 degree corner off my center. And the corner off my center. Point of intersection is my center point. I'll go ahead and I'll mark out the rest of them. So this is a very important part of this process. We need to cut both of these panels at the exact same time so they key together perfectly. So to do so, we're gonna screw both panels together, drill all the holes at the same time, core through both layers, make all the cuts, and then sand them to the line while they're screwed together. And if your screw sticks through on the back side, just gotta grind it off. It needs to be very smooth on the back side and you'll see why in a little bit. Okay, now those did stick out a little tiny bit, so I'm just going to grind them off. Okay, and you'll see I put some notes on here. This is the top in relation to the car. The six and a half inch wide is this way, six and a quarter tall. The only reason I'm not making it perfectly square is because I want a perfectly even border around the plate that comes with the um, air conditioning kit, and that plate is not a perfect square. So we made it this size so that we have an exact amount of trim all the way around on that piece that came with the kit. So I found these two different hole saws in my pile, and they're so old the numbers are worn off of them, but I think this is three inch, and this one's a little smaller. Okay, yep, this one is three inch on the outside. This one is two and three quarters. So I always like to go with the smaller size if possible, because these things wobble when they go through, and they always cut a hole bigger than what it says it's gonna do. This two and three quarters is probably gonna cut more like a two and seven eighths. And that'll leave me enough meat to sand a nice crisp square corner up to the line. Now, if possible, you wanna do this with a drill press. That way it goes through nice and square. If you try to hand drill this, chances are you're not gonna run it through perfectly square. And your hole's gonna be a little off. It's gonna take a lot more uh, sanding to get a nice crisp 90 degree corner. All right, so I'm just gonna throw a scrap under here so we can go ahead and break right through. This spring-loaded center punch is a little overkill, but it's the first one I saw. All right, that's definitely through. And into that lower piece, a protective piece. I'm gonna go ahead and cut the rest of them off camera. Now, in case you're wondering how much that walked, That right on there. It only walked, you probably can't see that. It only walked about a sixteenth. It's two and thirteen sixteenths. So that wasn't too bad. It stayed pretty true. But the key is, if we did the three inch, it would have been a sixteenth too far on both sides. It would have completely ruined this pattern. So we're much better off going a little undersized 
and then sanding to the line. Now the only lesson to be learned from the three holes I did off film was something I should have done on the first one that I filmed is after you punch through the first layer, you should pull the drill bit up and clean the plug out of the hole saw. Because if you drill through both layers, that first one gets shoved so far up into the uh, hole saw, it makes it a real pain in the butt to get it out of there. Now to cut these straightaways, we're going to use a real fancy expensive tool. Just kidding. This is a $20 piece of crap. When you're cutting through something this thick, the blade tends to bow and walk. So it ends up having a crooked cut. And I need both of these pieces to be exactly perpendicular to the top surface. I need perfect 90 degree sidewalls here. So I'm intentionally leaving it light because I don't know which way that blade's bending. It, the bottom piece might be even closer to my line. We want to sand up to that line. You can never go wrong with cutting anything light and sanding or trimming up to your line. Whether you're cutting wood, metal, anything. I always cut close to the line and then finesse it to the line. And I don't know if you can see it on camera, but those are definitely on an angle. It bowed in. The bottom piece has more meat. So we're going to sand these nice and square, again with a super expensive tool. Just kidding again, this thing is a total piece of crap. New, I think it was about 50 bucks, but it works pretty darn well. If you're not familiar with what this tool is, uh, I'm not sure its exact name, but I call it an oscillating drum sander. That might be right, might not be, but basically this barrel drum spins and oscillates up and down at the same time. The key is this surface to this surface is a perfect 90 degree. Okay, so let's try to finesse this right to the line. This is pretty easy to do. Just going up so I touch that pen line. Now having these edges and transitions between the straights and the radiuses is key to having a nice part. Because your die is going to follow this line. So however this pattern looks, however straight or however wiggly this pattern is, that's exactly how your metal's going to look. Your part will never be better than your pattern. Okay, I'm happy with that. The thing I like to do is just break these edges on the outside of the pattern. Makes it a little easier to handle. To take that sharpness away. So the main piece of tooling for this operation is something I made many, many years ago in the lathe. It's just a piece of 19 millimeter square stock lathed down into a half inch round barrel with a flat tip and radius edges. This is by far one of my most used tools in the pull max. So there we have it, six and a half by six and a quarter. Edges are perfectly square, sanded nice, two layers thick, keyed together perfectly. It's finally time to use this in combination with the pusher die and the firewall to make a nice stepped panel. Let's go ahead and get the Pullmax machine all set up. Let me show you my configuration. Your bottom tool is gonna be a table. My table is a 12 by 12 square with a post welded in the middle. Having a bigger table would be nice, but also very cumbersome to load and store. 
If you have guys around that can help you hold your panel, you're better off with something a little bit smaller like that. I'm going to use the center holder. And my secret trick is to put a shaft collar lock for setting our depth. I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute. And for our upper die, we are using that pusher that I showed you earlier. Let's go ahead and get this all set up. Now one thing to keep in mind is you got to make sure that this opening is greater than the thickness of your sandwich die plus your material. Since I like using the thicker wood, a lot of times I need to slip the panel in and then put the table in underneath it, kind of assemble it in here uh, in order to get everything to fit. You can always make this die a little bit shorter, but my machine is raised all the way up and this is all the way down. I do have a lower bottom die holder which gains me some extra clearance. So in my situation, I'm just going to use that. That way I don't have to take this apart, flip my panel in and try to get the table in underneath of it. So I'm going to switch this out for the low profile bottom holder. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to not use the low profile holder, which I will show that to you so you know what it looks like. On a P21, you have options of a tall nut and tall collet or a short one. So this is the tall nut and tall collet. I'm going to switch that out for the short nut and collet. You can see the difference here. That's going to gain me a little extra room. But like I said earlier, I do have a low profile bottom holder, which gains a lot of room. This has the nut and collet on it. So this in combination with the short nut and short collet and the tall nut and tall collet, same double combo in this, you get four different height options. Here's what that looks like with the, uh, with the nut off. So you can see the actual height difference. Pretty, pretty drastic. It's probably about mm, two inches you gain by using this. Okay, so now we have plenty of room just by changing to the short nut and short collet. With the pull max all set up, it's time to take the firewall off the truck. We need to screw our sandwich die to that firewall and make sure that the top and bottom are perfectly lined up. Okay. Flip it over. Okay, so you want to take your top die. If you're wondering why this looks used, it's because I just used it to do a test piece so I can set my depth, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, take your top die. We have our pattern drawn on here. That lines up perfectly with this. So you're gonna line that up. Then we're gonna clamp this on with some large clamps. Ah, so I'm just gonna bump this around. It's exactly where I want it. Now we're going to take an eighth inch drill bit and we're going to drill these four holes all the way through. Alright, now this can come off. So we have four holes drilled all the way through our panel. 
they line up with this perfectly. And since this was already screwed to the other panel, we're going to run our screws through these holes and we're going to intentionally spin them until they blow the threads out on this wood. We don't want it actually gripping this top piece while we're trying to thread into the bottom piece because it'll be a real pain to get all the pieces to draw together. Same with this metal. We need to have it blow these holes out just a little bit so it spins free and we're only screwing into that bottom wire. So we've got some new screws that don't have the tips ground off of them. I run these through and then spin it so it blows the threads out. And we're going to do that on all four holes. Okay, now we're going to put this back on here. The bottom piece is not in here just yet. Get these started in the holes. Screw this down. And go ahead and spin them so that they strip out the holes. This flares the metal out a little bit, and you probably think, well, that's messed up, but in all reality, it's actually going to assist you in a later step, and I'll explain why soon. So now we have these sticking through. Now we can lock in our lower piece, just making sure we keep the tops and everything lined up front to back because these holes aren't all in the exact same spot. These aren't all like a perfect square or anything. So make sure you have it facing the right direction and screw the bottom layer underneath. Lettering faces that way. Line up my holes. Now since we're not gripping these upper pieces, this should draw in pretty nicely. Just walk it in, back and forth. Draw it down until everything is nice and tight. It's very important that the panel is squeezed in there real good. So make sure it's down, flush, and snug. Okay. So we got both layers. They are keyed together perfectly, top and bottom, and our panel is sandwiched in the center. Now we want this indent in the firewall to push up, basically out towards the front of the vehicle. So we're going to put this in the Pullmax machine upside down. I even made a note on that back plywood die saying this side up when in use. That way I don't put it in upside down, not thinking, and I go ahead and do it backwards. So any notes you write yourself to help yourself out later is very, very handy. So do that if you need to. Okay, so here's what's about to happen. I'll talk you through it a little bit before we actually do it. The machine's a little bit noisy. I will be talking while we're doing it. You might not be able to hear everything I'm saying. So basically, the one side of the plywood is going to float on this table while the upper die pushes the metal from the other side, basically air bending it down into that hollow cavity. We're going to use the die edge, the edge of this die. We're just going to trace around the inside of the, of the one side of the form. Just follow the edge around and around and around. We're going to do multiple passes, slowly pushing it down into our final depth. Now I have my final depth already set. I did a test panel and I was talking about that shaft collar earlier on that lower adjustment. And let me show you what that does. So as we 
turn this, this table raises up. This has a set bottom dead center. This comes down to the same location every time. So to go deeper, we actually raise the table up. We do so by turning this. I already set my depth on a test panel and I put this lock, shaft lock on there. That's gonna go up and hit the bottom of the die. And when that seats, and that goes all the way up and stops, that's exactly where I wanna be so that this uh, step out on the firewall matches the other one that I did previously. So we're gonna wind that all the way back down. We always wanna start at the lowest setting. We're gonna go around one lap. After each lap, I'm gonna tweak this about that much. Do a lap. Another about a half a turn. Do a lap. Another half a turn. Do a lap. It's also important that you make your adjustments while the panel is moving. Don't stop and make an adjustment and then start moving again. It ends up leaving a lot of tooling marks. So try to do it on the fly, which can be difficult to reach down there and adjust that while you're trying to hold the panel and move it at the same time. But the better of a job you do adjusting it while traveling, the less tooling marks you'll have. Now I have a P21, so I have all these different stroke settings. I'm gonna do it in number three, which is a .118 stroke. My final couple passes, I'm gonna pull this down into two or one, which is a very fine stroke, which will give me better finish. I'm also gonna put a little oil on the panel, which helps with some tooling marks. I'm just gonna take my time, go nice and slow, and it should come out very nice. For the firewall this big, it's very important that I have a helper holding the weight of the panel, and it's also very important that he holds that panel level to the table. If he's letting it drop in the back, it's gonna really mess up the depth of where the tool goes because it's gonna tip it up, basically driving this further down into the hollow. It's gonna screw me up. So make sure you have a good helper and educate them on what they need to do. It's kind of like running an English wheel. If the person on the other end is letting the panel droop and sag, it's gonna screw everything up. The panel's gonna start taking that shape. So make sure they hold it nice and level for you. So we're gonna put the panel in here upside down. I'm gonna spray some lube in here. this touch till we touch off. Shoulders all right? Mm -hmm. All right, shortest stroke. Good. When I come back in, I want to be moving.
back corner one more time and a little bit of work in it. Take it back to the table. This is what it looks like on the back side. We push down to our final height. This panel is perfectly flat. Let's get this unscrewed and see how it looks. Here's how it looks from the front side. Nice and crisp. This is dead flat. And this is perfectly flat. No oil can of any kind. No pre-stretch. With the sandwich die now removed, let's get into some of the details about how and why that works the way it does. We'll also discuss what we're going to do about welding up these holes that we made in order to clamp that sandwich die to the panel. Now I'm definitely going to make a few videos specific on this topic of pre-stretch versus non-pre-stretch. There's a ton of different situations and every panel is different. Everyone has different equipment and you don't need any fancy equipment in order to do the pre-stretch when your panel calls for it. In those future videos, I'll try to set up a bunch of different situations and I'll do things the right way and the wrong way with lots of different tooling and machine options. I'll show you all the different scenarios you might get caught up in and how to work your way through them. But for now, we'll just stay on topic with this sandwich die and the Pullmax machine. I'll show you why it works and why it does not require any pre-stretch. It's a really basic concept and you would almost think that you have to take it a couple steps further to make it work well. And quite frankly, you don't. Not only do you have the friction of that three inch perimeter clamping the material, but those screws act as dowel pins. You would think that you'd really need to add four more screws in all the straightaways as well as the corners in order to pin that sufficiently. But you really don't need that much. Just those four corners was sufficient. The material cannot get pulled between the sandwich die to slip. And that's the key to making this work. If the material can't slip and get drawn into the center cavity, while that die is pushing that bead down just a little bit at a time, high RPM, low stroke, as we go around, we are physically stretching the material down into that cavity. Since it's in the center of this, and it's hollow underneath by three quarters of an inch, technically I could have pushed that down three quarters of an inch until I hit the table, making this three quarters of an inch high. Just a little excessive, that's a, that's a lot of draw, and I'd probably want to taper this radius a lot more so I didn't ask so much out of that edge because I could probably tear the material if I went too far. But we're actually physically stretching the material in. We're not forming it in like a bead roller. That's why we do not need to pre-stretch because we're creating this bead by physically stretching it in. We thin this material on this edge and push this panel down, keeping it flat and keeping any of the material from the outside perimeter getting drawn in. If this material got drawn in by the fact that we're making a 3D shape out of a 2D piece of material, if we drew this material in, it would have made this too short, creating tension, creating wrinkles, and a waffly effect on this outer, outer material here. This stayed totally flat. The center of this stayed totally flat. If you didn't do it right, or you try to draw this in too quick and too few of passes, you might not necessarily um, wrinkle the outside of this because again, it cannot get drawn in since it's pinned and sandwiched between the two dies, causing all that friction lock around. But if you drew this in too quick, too fast, too few of uh, passes, what would happen is you'd actually have a hollow section in the middle here you'd hollow this out. This would be concave. 
but it's not. It's nice and flat because I only went a little bit at a time. We just kept going around and around and around, stretching that in one pass after the next, thinning this material and stretching that down. That's why this stayed flat and that's why this stayed flat. That is the key to making a sandwich die work in a pull max machine. Now notice how these holes are dimpled up. I don't know if you can see that, but when I, when I ran the screw through, and I intentionally ran it through a hole that was a little small, these were just eighth inch holes I made, and when I ran the screw through and I intentionally stripped it out, it lifted this material up and stretched it. Normally you'd think, let's hammer that flat and then weld it up. But we're not going to do that. I'm going to leave it tall and weld it up. And I'm going to take advantage of having that stretched material so that after I weld this and the weld shrinks, this whole area doesn't go concave on me. So the process I'm referring to with leaving this metal stretched before we weld it is very similar to that of lipping the edge of a panel before you weld it. If you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say lipping the edge of a panel before you weld it, I'll be sure to make a video on that as well, so stay tuned for that coming up. But basically, as you should know by now, every time you weld metal, when it gets hot, it expands, and when it cools off, it shrinks smaller than it was before you heated it. So if we smash this flat, and I went and welded these holes shut, it's gonna shrink. Well, if it shrinks and it's already flat, it's going to go concave on me. We don't want that. You can easily stretch it back out with a hammer on dolly. But in all reality, if we leave this pre-stretched, this metal is already stretched up, and then we go and weld it, it's going to shrink back. It's going to be pretty much flat as is. You probably have to do a little bit of hammer and dolly work, but it definitely shouldn't go too concave on us. Now I shouldn't have to say this, but this process only goes if this metal isn't stretched beyond reason. I mean, if this is blown out and really crazy and all we're doing is filling a little hole, it's obviously not gonna shrink enough to take out a massive amount of overstretch. But this little tiny bit, it's gonna shrink it right up just how I want. All right, now let's go ahead and weld these up. <clears throat> I've got a couple things uh, prepared here with me. I already cleaned this off. I've got a hammer and a dolly underneath. Got that ready. I'm gonna keep that hammer in my swinging hand. So these holes are all proud, like I said, they're all stretched up, but not a ton. I'm gonna weld these holes shut. While it's hot, I'm gonna evaluate it real quickly and see if I think I need to shrink a little extra while it's cooling. It's basically, it's like doing a heat shrink. If you're doing a heat shrink on an area, you take your torch, you get a spot, cherry red, pull your torch away. While it's red and raised up, hammer and dolly, a couple wax, right on the hot spot. That gets everything to quickly crush together as it cools, causing a little extra shrink. It's pretty normal to have to uh, hammer the proud weld in on itself, for one. It's a little easier to do it when it's hot, Plus we want a little extra shrink since I left this proud. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if I need to hit that with a hammer and dolly while it cools. I might, I might not. Some of these are stretched. This one's probably the least stretched. These two are probably the most. So I might not hammer all of them, just some of them. Uh, but I have the tools ready to go in case I decide I need to do it. I'm only gonna have about a second to make that decision. That is looking a little proud. Don't whack it too hard. So that's cooling off and that is nice and flat. I should be able to sand that off and not have to hammer and dolly on that at all to raise that back up. It's not going concave. 
I watched it just as it cooled down. Had a nice proud weld to fill up that big hole. It was starting to quench and it was still proud. So I crushed that weld in on itself just a little bit. That went nice and flat. These other ones, like I said, are a little bit taller. So I might have to do a little bit harder of a hit to get that to settle nice and flat. I should be starting furthest away so I don't have to reach over the heat. Got a bunch of fans on in the shop today, so my weld's a little screwy. My argon's getting blown away a little bit. Actually, that one actually... That one didn't take much at all. That one's like perfect. I'm looking across the panel at the reflection. I've got tons and tons of lights, plus the whole shop's lined in the windows. Got a ton of light coming in, natural light, plus the um, fluorescence. Looking at that reflection across the panel around the sides, and that light reflection is, is perfect. It's not distorted at all because it's not going concave around that weld. So that one didn't take much at all. I'm going to pull this off the edge of the table. For these ones. I'm filling the hole. Once it's full, I'm doing a little swirl around it, cranking up the heat a little bit. This one's tall. got to watch because when it's still warm and we hit it on hammer and dolly we're shrinking but once it goes cold we're stretching that looks pretty darn good in fact that could actually use a little bit more shrink I'm going to reheat that re-swirl the center a little heat input in it. Okay, I like that one. So when that last one cooled off, it stayed a little proud. It needed a little bit more shrink. So I used the TIG torch and I reheated the center of that weld Got a cherry, gave it a little swirl, it raised up, got the torch out of the way, hammer on dolly, just like as if you were doing a heat shrink with an oxyacetylene torch, and I was able to tap that down nice and flat. I'll let them completely cool off, they're probably going to change a little bit as they fully cool down, but 90% of the initial change from the stretching and the shrinking happens immediately but as it continues to cool down it, it could pull a little flatter but this one's perfect that one's perfect that one might be the slightest tall same with this one it might be the slightest bit tall still so what I'll probably do is just let it cool off sand off the excess proud uh, weld the filler rod I added sand that off flat maybe give it a little a file or a quick blocking and see if there's any proudness left to, to any of these if there is I'll just heat it up a little bit more let that shrink down so basically if I if I crush them flat hammer and dolly and flatten that out before I welded it they would have caved low and it would have caved a large area 
Then we would have had to work the whole thing back up cold, hammer on dolly, stretching it all up and then planishing it back out. I want this whole area to be super, super flat. I don't want to have to do a bunch of body work to this once it's in the truck. I want this to be 99% metal. So having it proud and letting it shrink back down to a flat state is a little easier in my mind than letting it cave under on itself from all the shrink and trying to raise it back up and trying to blend that out into the rest of the panel. If you want specifics on metal finishing, nitpicking, uh, the hammer on dolly and getting something file finished perfect, we're not going to discuss this in that video. In this video, that's a completely different subject. I'll have tons and tons of videos on that coming up. We'll metal finish stuff to perfection. I'll show you how to get everything as perfect as possible. Uh, with as little fillers as possible. Stay tuned for those videos coming up. So I ground the welds off the outside. I don't know if you can see in that reflection. 